Okay, hi. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's truly an honor to be here. And um, really, I, I'm, I'm so, so grateful to be here um, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. That is like for me, like what better time to speak and to try and connect and to try and inspire than Rosh Chodesh Nisan, right? And, and Rosh Chodesh Nisan comes with this hope that we're gonna be seeing revealed miracles. So we're all open to like hearing what it is that we need to hear at this moment. So um, thank you so much to, uh, to the OU of Israel to, for inviting me to speak and big shout out to my sister who's in the front row who I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so, I'm going to share a little bit about my story, and I might go on a tangent, but um, just give me five five minute heads up when my time is coming to an end, because I get very into uh, into what I'm saying. So, um, my story is yes. All right. So, um, my story is um, it's not the easiest one to tell. Um, and it's not something that I've shared um, up until, I would say, I think two, two and a half years ago, I didn't speak about it publicly at all. Um, but I learned something in the Nesiva Shalom that I thought was so, so beautiful. And it's what made me decide to share my story. So um, what the Nesiva Shalom says is it says, when Yaakov gave, when Yaakov gave um, Yosef the Ksonas Pasim, right? We always learned that he gave him the Ksonas Pasim. Why? Because he was his favorite son. And he wanted to connect with him, and he wanted to show this. That he, you know, he wanted to express his, his incredible dedication to his son and how much he loved him. And um, the, Nesiva, the Nesiva Shalom says something so beautiful. He says that Yaakov, the, the, the word, Ksonas Pasim, the word Pasim, is actually an acronym for everyone that Yosef was going to be sold to, right? So you have the Plishtim, you have the Soicherim, which are the general merchants, you have the Yishmaelim, and you have the Midianim. And what Yaakov was in essence saying to Yosef is, these are going to be the challenges that you're going to go through in your life. But something about the Ksonas, pa the Ksonas Pasim is that it's not something that was worn underneath clothing. It's not something that was hidden. It was something that was worn on top of clothing. It was a coat. And what made Yosef HaTzadik, Yosef HaTzadik, was the fact that he took his struggles and he took his trials and tribulations and he never used them as an excuse. He always took everything that he went through and he wore it on the outside. He wore it on his sleeve, proud. That's what created Yosef HaTzadik. We all go through things in our lives that are incredibly difficult and we have two choices. Now, on one hand, no one, no one would blame us for wanting to bury our struggles and our, and our tribulations. And we'd have every excuse to, right? Sometimes it's just too painful. But what this is coming to teach us is that what we should try and do, what our aim should be, is to take it and to wear it on the outside, to take the things that we go through and to see how we can help other people and what we can do to better the Jewish people with the things that we've gone through. So when I heard that, I thought it was so beautiful. And I decided to share my story publicly. Um, my story is, is one that's very full of a lot of twists and turns and a lot, a lot of Yad Hashem. And um, okay, so I'm gonna start at the beginning. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna hold it. So I was born in Israel to an incredible, incredible mother and father. And um, my father, when I was three years old, was offered to move to South Africa. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> um, was, uh, my father was asked to move to South Africa and to start, head up a, a shul there, right? Huh? Okay. Um, so, so my father was very much seized the day and always looking for new and, and more opportunities to connect to, to different Jews. So they decided he wasn't, you know, he didn't, wasn't the type of person who uh, always thought everything through. Um, and he decided to pick up his family of three kids and his wife and move to South Africa. And so we moved there and we had what would be considered a picture perfect life. Um, my parents were the absolute best of friends. Um, and, and everyone knew it. My, my father never, he, he made a very big deal about the fact that my mother was the absolute love of his life. And um, we 
he started this minion, incredible, incredible shul called Sunny Road in South Africa. And from there, um, we, our lives began. And we had lots and lots and lots of different people over for Shabbasim. And we were completely surrounded by love and attention. And, and just, we had a very, very beautiful, picture perfect life. Um, when I was five years old, I remember waking up to the sound of screaming. And I went out very confused, didn't know what was going on. Um, and I walked out of, my, out of my room and I looked in the living room and my mother was sitting on the couch. And she, her face was completely white, ashen white. And she called my little sister and my brother over and she told us that my father had passed away in his sleep, suddenly. He was 28 years old, didn't have any pre-existing conditions, nothing indicated that anything was wrong and he just didn't wake up. And that completely broke my family. In one moment, our entire, our entire foundation was shattered and he was ripped away from us and my mother lost the best thing that ever happened to her. Sorry, I get very emotional every time I speak about it. Um, a big reason is because I have been incredibly blessed with the most incredible husband and so much of, of, of my relationship with him reminds me of my relationship with my mom and my, and my father and the thought of, of losing someone you love that much about at the age of 25 years old who left behind four kids is it's very difficult to understand or comprehend. Uh, my mother is the strongest, most incredible person I have ever met. She is my biggest role model in life, in everything, in every area. And um, she did everything she could to ensure that we had a really, really special, beautiful upbringing. So two years after my dad passed away, we moved to America. My mother wanted to be near her family. And we lived there. And I think I, I blocked out a lot of, you know, being, you know, losing my father at such a young age and dealing with all of that not something that I necessarily choose to remember. Um, and a couple, uh, a year and a half after that, I would say, um, my mother began dating again. And I was really angry. And I am a very, a very outspoken, very emotional person. So I did not keep it to myself. And I was like trying to scare off anyone that she was potentially interested in. I would stay up at a until all hours of the morning on the couch crying. She'd walk in and I'd give her a two hour guilt trip and you know, and I definitely did not make it easy for her. Um, and I was really, really angry. It was very confusing to me. Like why would my mother choose to replace my father? Like he was her best friend. She was always saying it. Like why did we need somebody else, right? So, um, so when I was 10, uh, nine and a half, almost 10, my mother heard that one of the people that my father had helped bring closer to Yiddishkeit was coming to America. He was learning in America and she remembered him being a really good person and she had a lot of single friends so she decided to go and um, have coffee with him and see what he's looking for. Maybe she could set him up with one of her friends. So they went for coffee and the coffee turned into dinner and obviously, you know, I'm sure you could guess the rest. Um, they decided that they were going to see how things go and they dated for a couple of months and um, they got engaged. And I remember I saw an email from him that said like it was the subject was like hi sweetie or something and the first time I met him I like he's like hi I'm, I'm Paul and I'm like don't you ever call my mother sweetie again and I like walked away and 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 I was young I was like you know and it just got harder for him <laughs> from there um, but they got engaged and and we moved back to South Africa which was a very difficult adjustment um, but we were really really blessed that my mother married an incredibly kind selfless caring understanding person who really he adopted four children like you know who we all were, were ranging between um, te 11 and no yeah we were ranging the, the ages between 11 and and how, how is this five or something like that and um, and he just totally adopted us and he took us in as his own and he looked after us in such an incredible way um, and I truly am so so grateful to him he is an incredible, incredible father. Um, I remember I was having a very, very hard time with everything and he went into my room and I, I couldn't understand again like why my mother was trying to replace him and my father and he came into my room and he hung up a picture of my father, my, um, my late father holding me when we were 
in the hospital when I was first born. And he said to me, he said, my job is to look after you. It's not here to replace your father. Like, I'm, I'm not here. I could never. And he knew how great my father was. He, he, he knew because he had a personal relationship with him. So we were very, very blessed in that way. Anyway, a couple of years go by and life continues. Um, you know, definitely there were easier times and harder times. Um, and, when, and my parents had one daughter, beautiful little baby girl. Um, and then they had another daughter and everything was great. And when I was um, almost 14 years old, I found out that someone in my family, someone that I cared for very, very deeply, after a lot of different tests and you know um, doctor's appointments, we found out that she had cystic fibrosis. Um, so I'm sure all of you know what that is, but it's a it's a it's a genetic disorder that it can be life threatening. And I remember, <coughs> I came yeah. So we found that out, and and it, again in one minute it felt like my world had fallen apart. I just remember going to my mother and saying to her like. I cannot love someone else and lose them again. I can't do it. Like, it's just too painful. And she said to me, she said, would you rather have known that you loved that person with every ounce of your being or never loved them at all? Like, take the time that you have to, to, to spend with them and appreciate them and love them. And, and I did the absolute best that I could, but it was very, very painful and very scary, and I was very, very angry. And to me, it felt so unfair. Like, Hashem... You've put my mother through enough. And like now this, like I was so angry. I couldn't understand it. And um, so like I said, I was very outspoken. I, I'd always been a little bit rebellious uh, or a lot rebellious. And I was always trying to push boundaries in some way. So when I was around that age, around 14, I started noticing that guys started taking notice, at, you know, started noticing me or talking to me, and I was very flattered. And so I started speaking to guys at a very young age. And um, I think I had my first boyfriend at like 13, maybe not even 14 years old. Um, and so it began with that. And um, slowly but surely, not so slowly, but over as time passed, um, I remember feeling the tremendous resentment of and, 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 and sadness and anguish of what was going on and confusion and I started acting out. So it started with boys. I started wearing shorter skirts. I started wearing pants. I, um, over time, stopped keeping Shabbos, stopped keeping kosher. I was doing everything in the house. I had a tremendous amount of respect for my parents and I um, and my parents always really, really showed us w the beauty of Torah and mitzvot. So I knew how important it was to them. But I wasn't interested in doing it. So in the house, I'd do what I had to. And out of the house, I did what I wanted to. And um, life continued. And I was getting farther and farther, farther away. I was, I was falling deeper and deeper. And I was drinking every single weekend. My, drinking myself stupid, like, like I didn't remember most of what happened most weekends. And I really think that that was kind of a band-aid to like put over what was going on for me. And, and also just like I thought it was fun, so like I'm going to be real, like I thought it was more fun to do that than to, you know, be doing other things. Anyway, um, I went to a Chabad school in South Africa called Torah Academy. I don't know if any of you know about it. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal school. Um, and the principal, Rebecca Sarkey, who is another one of my tremendous, tremendous role models and mentors in life, um, and she, she really, really believed in me, and, and I knew it. Now, she tried to kick me out of the school so many times, but then she would call me back and be like, let's have coffee or let's just talk, and she always made me feel like she believed in me and she loved me, and this was just a stage in my life, and she never attributed my behaviors to the person that I was. So the one day I was sitting on her desk, I was 17 years old, wasn't keeping Shabbos, wasn't keeping kosher, wasn't religious at all anymore. And she said to me, she said, I want to ask you a question. She said, in five years time, what does your life look like? So without even thinking, I said to her, I said, I want to marry an incredible person. I want to have Shabbosim. I want to raise my children from, I want to have... I want to have guests. I want to bring people closer to Yiddishkeit. And like these words were just spilling out of my mouth. But I wasn't even keeping Shabbos at that point. And I didn't even know where it was coming from. And the only thing that I think I could attribute it to, two things. The first is that my father epitomized what I was describing. 
and I grew up ide idolizing who he was. I, I, I'd been told about him my entire life by so many different people. He had, sat, he had had such a profound impact on the world at such a young age, at 28, he still to this day, people come over and tell me amazing stories of how he somehow managed to help bring them back to Yiddishkeit. So that was always someone that I looked up to and admired. Um, and I also think that my mother and my stepfather really showed me what it means to have a relationship with Hashem, what it means to keep the Torah mitzvot. And I never was resentful of it because I didn't believe it. I just resented it because I was a teenager who wanted to have fun. But I always believed in the Torah and the mitzvot. And I was always talking to Hashem in my own, in my own words. So it didn't surprise me that this was my response. But what surprised me was my principal's reaction. And she was like, she's listening and she looks all moved. And like, you know, I'm thinking like, she's like, okay, like, I don't know. I don't know how I expected her to respond. But she said to me, she said, that sounds amazing. She said, you're never going to get that. So I'm like, those are real words of encouragement. Like, thank you for believing in me. And, and she's like, no, I'm going to be serious with you. You cannot expect to be able to live your life the way that you want to and one day wake up and decide to change everything and marry some incredible person who, like, is going to take you on this journey of life that, like, you're describing, right? So that, those words definitely had a profound impact. And then I went out later that night and I got drunk again and forgot about the whole conversation. And, um, but it had done something to me. And later on that year, I went to Israel and I remember standing by the Kotal and I was there with friends and we were hanging out. We were not there to dive in, we were just there to hang out. And I remember sitting with my friends and thinking to myself like, this is the Kotal Hamaravi. Ha like I'm sitting here hanging out with a bunch of like guys and girls when like 10 steps away, I could be closer to Hashem than I ever have been. Like it, it's, it, it seemed like it, it didn't make any sense to me. But again, I did what, I, you know, it was a nice thought. And then I went, I came back to South Africa. Simchas Torah. My 17th, I was 17 years old with Simchas Torah, which now actually seems very profound that this happened on Simchas Torah. I was, was it Simchas Torah? No. Uh, yeah, it was Simchas Torah. Okay, so I was standing behind, I was standing behind Shul. And I was speaking to a bunch of older guys, flirting with a bunch of older guys. And I wasn't dressed tanua. I was wearing a short skirt. I was wearing short sleeves. And I was in shul to hang out. And I had a cigarette in one hand and a beer in another hand. And I was like, you know, too cool for anyone else. And I was speaking to them and I said to them, I really want to understand. I knew that these boys had grown up irreligious. I knew that none of them came from religious homes. So I said to them, why is it that you decided to become religious when you didn't have to? Nobody was forcing it down your throat and you chose to put those restrictions on yourself on your own? It didn't make any sense to me. Like, why would any person want to do that, right? So they said to me, they said, they all grew up irreligious. A lot of them grew up in homes that were very anti-religious. And they went to a school called King David in South Africa, and there was uh, primarily, I mean, now there's more and more religious kids that are going there, but at that point there was very, very few religious kids that were there. And they said that they got a new teacher. They got a new teacher for Jewish studies, and um, which like, already was like a big deal that they had hired a teacher to teach Jewish studies. And they said that this teacher walked in, and from the second that they walked in, there was something different about this teacher. And over the course of the year, he somehow managed to take a group of children who were so disconnected from Hashem, reframe their minds as to what connection to Hashem is, could be, and could look like, and inspire them to want that more than anything else. And they were telling me that, you know, this teacher would like, it, it was a class of like, they discussed everything in Yiddishkeit. But this teacher had had such a profound impact on them that he would go outside during break, during recess, and say to them, if anyone wants to come and sit and hang out and talk and learn during recess, I'm under the tree. Anyone who wants can come, feel free. And three quarters of their class, whenever that teacher was there, would take their recesses to sit with this teacher and learn with him. And I'm like, wow, if a bunch of teenagers are that inspired, 
a bunch of irreligious teenagers, then maybe this is exactly what I'm looking for. So I said to them, I said, I would love to speak to this teacher. I want to like, you know, I don't know, connect. Maybe this is the answer that I'm looking for. And just before this, I'd actually said to, I remember like, like within the last couple of weeks, I was speaking to Hashem and I said like, I have done every possible thing imaginable and I cannot imagine coming back. I cannot imagine you still loving me. Send me some sign that it's not too late. You know, because we're always told like Hashem's never going to turn us away. But really, do we believe that? How much do we believe that, you know? So I remember saying this to him. And so this whole thing happens, and I was like, oh, this is like a gift from Hashem. Like, maybe this is exactly who I need to speak to in order to be inspired. And so they said, to, so I said, can I have his number? They said, no. So I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> they said, he passed away many years ago. So I said, what was his name? They said, Gavriel Klatsko. And I started crying, because Gavriel Klatsko was my father. And I was standing there with tears running down my cheeks and trying desperately to hide that I was crying because I was so embarrassed that I was his daughter and he had managed to bring so many people closer to Hashem and I was his daughter and look at me. That was the one feeling I had. And the other feeling I had was tremendous, tremendous. It was going to come. Tremendous, tremendous pride in the fact that my father had done what he did. So, so from that moment, still wasn't keeping Shabbos, still wasn't keeping kosher. I decided that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I've been able to. I went home. I remember some chastar was raining. I went home. I threw on my pants. I threw on my mini skirts, and I decided to come to Israel. I met my husband on a bus the first night of seminary. <laughs> and um, we've been married for almost 12 years. And he is literally the closest person to perfection I have. He is the most imperfect, perfect, imperfectly perfect human being I've ever met in my life. And not a day goes by where I don't feel full more and more in love with him and don't feel more and more grateful to have him sharing this journey of life with me, with, alongside our beautiful children. So, so there's a few things. So after that, we, we, we got married, we moved to Israel for a year, and then we moved back to South Africa, and then we moved back to Israel. And um, I really did not want to move to Israel at all. I had zero interest in moving here. I had a comfortable life in South Africa, but I told my husband that if he had been offered a job in Israel, we would go back, and I thought I was safe because no one has jobs in Israel, right? Well, he was offered a job, and we came to Israel, and I was miserable here. I was absolutely miserable here. And six months in, we decided that we were going to go back to South Africa. We booked our tickets. We were going back. I was having my second, and to the point where my grandmother, um, my, my incredible grandmother, she booked her ticket to South Africa already to be there for the, for the birth. Like, we were going back. And the one day I was walking with my son, and we were wa I was walking him to Ghan, and I saw two Arabs that looked a little bit suspicious, but, like, at that point, there was so much going on. There was so much building that, like, you know, it wasn't so crazy to see Arabs just walking around, but there was something about them. And I dropped my son at Ghan, and I started walking back up the road, and you know like in the movies where everything gets quiet and like it's an indication that something really terrible is going to happen? It really felt like that's what was happening. And I saw a baby carriage fly down the street. Thank God there was no baby in it. And I see these two Arabs that I had walked past a couple minutes before running. I heard gunshots and, they, and, and the police had shot them. And what had happened, these two Arabs had been stalking an Israeli soldier for two weeks and they were planning an attack. That day, that Israeli soldier called in sick and asked if he could go into, on t if he could go to base two hours late. So their, their plan had failed. What did they try to do? They tried getting on a kid's hasa. They weren't able to get on. So they went to the closest shul to them and they stabbed someone in his head outside of shul. And two days later, I saw that person that they stabbed walking straight back into the same shul that he was stabbed outside of. And I called my husband absolutely panicking. And I was like, we need to leave. I can't. We need, like, it's funny. Like, I was like desperate to go back to South Africa, which is like not exactly the safest of places. 
But I was like, I was like, that's it, we're leaving, we can't be here, we can't raise family here, we can't, you know? And I was panicking. And it was just before Shabbos. And I, and my husband came home and I was really in a bit of a state and I decided to go shopping for Shabbos. And as I'm standing inside Yesh, I'm seeing these messages on the WhatsApp groups for our community. And what is it saying on these WhatsApp groups? Can everyone in their shul please, please put together a brachos party to thank Hashem for not making this attack worse? And I called my husband in shul, uh, in, in the shops, and I was crying, and I said to him, I, I forgot to say at this point, my husband ha was working, but he was not making nearly enough to support us, and our government money was ending. And so it was a perfect time to go back. And we had no, if, if we weren't getting financial support from the government, we were completely, a, we, were, we were not gonna be able to make it here. So it was a big reason why we decided to go back. So I called my husband while I was in the store and I said to him, I said, I don't know how we're gonna be able to do it, but there is no chance that I'm going to take my children away from a country where this is the reaction after a terror attack where we are surrounded by people who so deeply see Yad Hashem in every single thing that happens. I'm, I, I can't take that away from my children. So I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know how we're going to be able to m figure out Parnassah, but we're staying. We're, I'm not going back. We're not going back. Later that day, my husband, my husband had been working at this place for six months. His boss calls him out of the blue, and he says, are you still going back to South Africa? So my husband's like, I don't know, my wife's pregnant, she's saying no, but maybe it's a yes, I'm confused, like he didn't know what, what you know, like maybe I was gonna change my mind in five seconds. So his boss said to him, he said, I don't want this to be a deciding factor for you, but if you decide to stay, I will double your salary and give you a car. And it was like Hashem was just waiting for us to get there. He just was waiting for that little opening. And then he took care of the rest. And it's been the most unbelievable thing. I mean, I could literally sit here for three hours telling you, all the most incredible stories of how Hashem has shown up in ways that we could never possibly understand or imagine, right? And um, so one of the things that I was learning about, about Pesach, right? My, my mother was, was sh shared this with me and I thought it was so beautiful. The, the words that describe the relationship, that define the relationship between us and, and Hashem is the words, um, is the words, Anochi Hashem Lokecha, Asher Hotseischa, Me'eretz Mitzrayim, right? I am Hashem your God that took you out of Mitzrayim. So, why is that the words that are used to define our relationship with Hashem? Hashem created the world. Why is it not Anochi Hashem Lokecha who created the entire world and created the planets? And I mean, there, there were much greater things that happened than Yitzhak Mitzrayim, right? So, why is this the thing that Hashem decided to use to, to, to show his, his love for the Jewish people? During the times of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Jewish people were on the 49th level of Tumah. We were so, so disconnected from Hashem. So what is Hashem saying when he uses this as the example of his undying love for us? He's saying, despite the, in sp despite the fact that we're so disconnected and you're so far away from me, I'm still going to redeem you from Mitzrayim. And not just that, I'm going to redeem you in the most incredible ways, surrounded by miracles and singing and dancing and joy. He could have just, he could have just decided that power just thought it was too much of a hassle, too difficult to have the Jewish people as slaves, and he could have just let us go. But what did Hashem do? He hardened power's heart so that he could show us how much he loves us, that he was willing to turn the world upside down just for the sake of the Jewish people. And this is, this is what we're seeing, this is what we're seeing now, right? We're, 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 we're living, someone, one of my friends asked me, um, she said to me, she said, why do you keep up with the news? We live in Israel, it's painful enough what's going on. Why, why, why do you keep up with what's going on in the rest of the world? And I said to her, I said, if I don't keep up and I don't see on a personal level for me, it feels like I am witnessing Yitzhak Mitzrayim with my eyes shut. Because if we open our eyes, there are the craziest, most incredible miracles that are taking place right now. 
and forget about the miracles. Look at the achtos that we're seeing. This is Mashiach. Look at how we are treating one another. I, I, I started this WhatsApp group at the beginning of the war. I was standing on my merpeset, pretty much completely frozen in fear and devastation most of the day. And I have five kids to look after, and I needed to be able to step myself out of it. But I didn't know how to. October 7th happened, and it was like our entire world collapsed. And I remember it was uh, October 7th was Shabbos on Monday. I walked around the house. My sister came to stay with me for a couple of days, and my brother and, and my sister and her sister. And, I, um, and I, I, I walked around the house, and I packed a go bag for my kids because who knew? Who knew what was going to happen? I was choosing what clothing my kids would wear, thinking if they get kidnapped, are they going to be warm enough? The fear was so real for every single one of us. And the only thing that was able to distract me was seeing the absolute, incredible beauty of the Jewish nation. And I started realizing that all I have to do is look. And it's everywhere. So I started this WhatsApp community where I decided that if I'm going to be you know, impacted in a positive way and this is going to be able to distract me, then why not share it? Now, there's multiple communities and there's over, I think, 5,000 people from every country in the world that are sharing all of these videos that I'm sending out. And I'm just a conduit. And I feel like I am living an absolute dream. I feel like I am living when I made the promise to myself that this is what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to emulate Hashem in some way. I wanted to bring Jews closer to Yiddishkeit through love, through Achtos, exactly what my father did, and I feel like I'm living it right now. Being the conduit for spreading the unbelievable beauty of the Jewish people is the biggest gift I have ever been given. And so, um, just to end off, I know that my time is running short, but I wanted, to, um, I wanted to read something to you that I had written, actually, for this group, because I was trying to give people a sense of what it is to live here. And it's very, very hard to explain in just a couple of words, so I decided to write a letter to the Jewish people, so that they get a sense and understand what it is to live in Israel during this time. And I am sure, without a question, that if you listen to the words all of you who are in the audience and understand what it is to live in Israel during this time will absolutely agree with every single thing that I say. So I want to read it to you. Um, and, and the other thing that I just wanted to say is that, one second, here. Okay. Um, the, 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 the time that we're living in right now is so incredibly painful and so terrifying and so scary. And we had our Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim moment. What was our Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim moment? October 8th. When all of us came together and stood next to one another with our arms wrapped around each other. But now it's six months into the war. And a lot of people are losing that. And what we have to do as a Jewish nation is to say, this is where the work begins. It's very nice to have that fleeting moment of inspiration, but what every single one of us has to do right now is to take that, to internalize it, and to better our nation with it. There are a lot of things that could distract us, protests and you know, different things that are going on within the government, and that's exactly what they are. They're distractions. The more that we, okay, the more that we, the more that we try and understand how and why the world is responding the way that they are, the crazier we're going to go, because there is no explaining how the world is reacting the way that it is. But the sooner that we stop trying to understand it and convince the rest of the world that we're right, and we take that energy and that time, and we put it into bettering ourselves as a nation the sooner we will save the Jewish people. We aren't meant to understand why what's happening is happening. We don't understand Hashem. And there's a tremendous relief in giving over and accepting that we're never going to understand Hashem's ways 
We need to stop trying to understand all of this because we aren't meant to understand it. Okay? So I just wanted to end off with this letter that I wrote. Um, okay. The real truth about living in Israel during this time. A lot of people have been asking me what it has been like living in Israel and raising a family during this time. Things seem to be getting worse and worse, harder and harder to bear. The pain of our brothers and sisters is indescribable. It's tangible. It's insurmountable. How do we continue? How do we go on? Where does our strength come from? Here is the truth. The truth is that my heart breaks for every one of you who are not here during this time, who don't get to witness firsthand what Israel has become during this unbelievably difficult and exceptionally beautiful time. Israel is a different country. It is a country overflowing with love, with unity, with acceptance, with bravery, with sacrifice, and most importantly, with an undying belief and trust in Hashem. Yes, there is a never-ending feeling of grave fear and desperation in the air, fear for the safety of our soldiers and fear for the safety of our precious hostages, desperation to bring our brothers and sisters home now. There is a fear of the war escalating as things intensify in both the North and the South, as Israel and our hero soldiers prepare for any challenges that we may need to overcome. The consistent feeling of dread and terror of chas v'shalom, losing more of our brothers and sisters who are so selflessly and bravely fighting for the safety of our nation. There is a heart-wrenching feeling of sadness for those who have lost so much and those who have suffered so terribly already. Our heart is quite literally breaking for one another. However, there is also a tremendous feeling of unity. One would think that after six months, things would die down. People would lose their initial desire to do whatever they can to help. One would think that people would run out of money to give or run out of space to host total strangers who have been evacuated. One would think that people from overseas would slowly stop sending suitcases full of, full of gear, clothes, and aid, and stop making solidarity trips and get back to their regular lives. But no, not the Jewish nation. Our innate desire to help one another, the unity amongst our nation, and the desperate need to lift each other's spirits and inspire one another to get through every single day is as strong as it was on the 7th of October. In Israel, it still is the 7th of October. We are still feeling the rawness of what took place and the desire to hold on to each other as strongly as ever before. There is a feeling of undeniable love for one another. We have washed away the outer judgments and have truly felt what it means to be like one man with one heart. There is an overwhelming feeling of support and a longing to try and get through this together as a nation. Nothing has changed. While we have had to face the travesties of what happened and what continues to happen every day, we as a nation are holding each other up and not letting go. The intense desire and yearning to connect to Hashem is quite literally stronger than ever before. The incredible bravery of those who have lost loved ones and their unbelievable and immense belief in Hashem is what is keeping us going. So yes, it's terrifying and we want it to end. But the incredible beauty of our nation far outweighs the evil of those trying to destroy us. It's how we know without a question that once again the Jewish nation will prevail. We will come out more united and stronger than ever before. So to the answer the question, where does our strength come from? Our strength comes from the accepting that we don't and never will understand. Our strength comes from the surrendering to Hashem and begging for Him to hold us as we try to get through this insanely painful and tremendously difficult time. Our strength is in our deep, deep, undying faith that there is a bigger picture and that Hashem knows exactly what He is doing. It's in the knowledge that He loves us and it's in the knowledge that He is all good. Our strength comes from the love, our deep love for one another. Our strength comes from our immense desire to ease the pain of our brothers and sisters. Our strength is in the showing up even when the showing up is for a person we have never met. 
Our strength is in the relationships we have formed within our nation in a u and a unity that we possess that we never knew existed before. Without these strengths, the pain is too great to bear. It's why we need to, now more than ever before, hold on to them tighter than anything else. So what's it like living in Israel during this time? It's the most incredible honor. It's the most incredible honor to be here and to witness this nation come together and fight with every ounce of our strength to protect, love, and support one another. I would not trade being here or raising my children in Israel for anything. Being a Jew, being an Israeli, being a part of Am Yisrael are the greatest gifts of life. May we all merit to witness and dance in celebration at the safe return of our hostages and soldiers and to witness revealed miracles and the coming of Mashiach.